once again, everyone. So we gave it that five minutes, and we're going to keep our fingers crossed that it does pause at some point during Morgan's time with us. But in the interest of time, I want to be respectful of everyone who's come here, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So good morning. Welcome to our fifth week of Past to Present 2023. If you haven't met me already, my name is Julia, and I work in the education department here. Um, friendly reminder to check in with the front desk if you haven't already. Those numbers are really important for us to keep track of as the lecture series is going on. And this week's speaker is a very special guest named Morgan Heim. So from trekking across the tundra to find the world's fattest reindeer, to descending beneath the Astoria Megler Bridge for Cormorants, Morgan Heim is a conservation photographer, filmmaker, and adventurer, focusing on the ways human-influenced environmental changes impact wildlife. With a background in ecology and journalism, her goal is to find the beauty, humor, and perseverance in stories about wildlife, and how those stories teach us about who we are and what we might become. Morgan is a senior fellow of the International League of Conservation Photographers, a mentor for Girls Who Click, and founder of Neon Raven Story Labs, a storytelling and strategy platform for conservation. In 2020, she co-launched her Wild Vision initiative aimed at raising the voices of diverse women in the craft of conservation visual storytelling. Her work appears in outlets such as Audubon, Smithsonian, National Geographic, Newsweek, and the New York Times. She lives in Astoria, where the waves are big, the mountains close, and the weather not nearly as bad as everyone thinks it is. <laughs> Without further ado, please welcome Morgan Heim. sweaters like in the forests out here. But what I do with conservation photography is basically explore the world in the intersect between nature and our lives. And so some of you may be familiar with this little sea creature. It's actually not that little. It's a sunflower sea star. And it's on the docks in Friday Harbor Lab up in the San Juans. And this is a sea star that if you've had any work out on the ocean or in the intertidal zone, for a long time you may have seen them everywhere. They were just all over the place. And in the last 10, 10 years, since 2013, they've been hit really hard by a mystery wasting disease. Scientists still don't know what has, has caused it. And this sea star has gone from very common to now is it is critically endangered under the Endangered Species Act in just a decade. I photograph things like mountain lions in the backyard. This is actually in my friend's backyard in Boulder when I lived there um, about a decade ago. And this is a mountain lion. My friend came to me one night and said, yeah, we were watching a movie in our apartment and a mountain lion came to our sliding glass door. So I strapped a camera trap to a bird bath and some patio furniture and we left it out for a couple months and lo and behold, the mountain lion came back. In Boulder, 
gets upwards of 70 mountain lion sightings just in the city of Boulder each year. I document reintroduction efforts. Uh, this is for a project on the um, masked bob white quail, which there's only about 200 of them left and for probably about 30 years now, they've been doing captive breeding programs to boost these numbers back in the wild. And this is a male mass bob white who has just adopted 15 babies, like literally within minutes, <laughs> and they've all shoved their way underneath his feathers. Um, this is from right here. <laughs> I'm sure you're all familiar with our towny deer and, and, and the joys and hazards and frustrations they can bring. And this is for a project looking at roadkill. And so I've created these memorial portraits of different wildlife that I find out on the roads. I do them right out, right out there on the roads. I have safety equipment and everything. And at one point, the um, police department even <laughs> knew me by name because they're like, "Oh, that's that lady doing the memorial portraits of wildlife." They they got to know me. Um, but I I look for ways to try to portray the harsh or tragic in, in beautiful light in some way to get people to stop and pay attention and think about these issues, you know. Just here alone in the United States account for about a million car accidents and uh, over a billion dollars in damages. Columbia Basin Pygmy Rabbits. <laughs> Has anyone ever gotten to see one of these little guys? So, oh, Lynn in the back there. Nice, Lynn. Um, yeah, there's only about 150 of these guys left on Earth. And you can find them in Washington State, South Central Washington, and then Columbia Basin. And um, then when they are adults, they're only about the size of a mango and lay less, way, way less than a pound. How big are they? They're about, uh, they're about the adults are about the size of a mango fruit. That's the biggest they ever get. And um, so I went out with scientists up there and documented some of the reintroduction work and habitat restoration work and work with uh, local landowners to set aside habitat for these rabbits. This is a barred owl uh, down in Northern California and was for a story on the Northern Spotted Owl, which certainly, you know, iconic species for this area. It has a lot of history and controversy behind it, and now the big threat to them um, are barred owls, and so there are removal programs taking place with barred owls to try to give northern spotted owls space to breathe. But barred owls in their own right are still also these amazing, beautiful creatures, and so part of the challenge became how they portray this act with some empathy, both for the owl and for the person who has to remove it. And so when the biologist happened to make this gesture, to me it just was an overwhelming moment of tenderness um, in a tough, tough um, practice of conservation. Conservation work is not always pretty. So we've got urban coyotes, and don't worry that that arm is not real. <laughs> it's a prosthetic. <laughs> um, but scientists are studying the behavior of urban coyotes, trying to understand what makes some coyotes thrive in urban settings, whether they're more bold. And in this case, they're doing a test to see how bold this coyote is, and then it'll be also outfitted with a collar and tracked <clears throat> as it goes around the cities the city of Chicago and its surrounding suburbs. And they like to use things like industrial yards and green belts and railroad tracks and things like that to navigate their territories. And of course, always at the heart of these stories are people. And for me, it's, it's never about just what is happening to the wildlife, it's also what is happening to all the lives involved. So um, in this case, it's ranchers in Colombia who are protecting a place called the Llanos Plains, which is like the Brazilian Pantanal. It's sort of like a 
flat wetland area in the middle of the country. And they are cattle ranchers. They are known for their cattle ranching and also for their music and their dance, and they are leading the way in protecting a lot of the habitat and wildlife that rely on this ecosystem. And I go out with scientists who are risking their lives, literally, to understand what are happening to our forests. This is Greta Wenger down in Northern California. And she's a scientist who goes out and monitors the impacts of cannabis trespass grows by drug cartels on public lands down in, in California. So she has to be escorted. She goes in with law enforcement teams. Um, they go in on days of drug busts and they immediately assess these areas to find out what kinds of chemicals and damages have been used in that landscape. Volunteers working to monitor wildlife for months on end. She's a doctor, she's not a scientist, and she works out on an island for three months a year monitoring a critically endangered tern in China. And she lives in this literal like trucking container. <laughs> all summer long without pay and then of course how many of you have run into a situation like this <laughs> this is this is a, a skill from one of my my newer local projects um, so I'm gonna mine you all for information after this if that's okay uh, but I am working on a project about elk in the north coast here <laughs> So how are we living with all these creatures? So to kind of bring it all together in my first example of a cohesive kind of story, I want to take a little detour before we head out to the barometer birds to Svalbard and share with you a, a little story about the world's smallest and fattest reindeer. So I went up to Svalbard, which is an island North of Norway, it's kind of this interesting place where it's, it's a demilitarized zone. It's I mean, technically part of Norway, but it's it's actually um, almost like Antarctica. There's all these different countries that are existing there. No one really governs it. No one country governs it. But there's all this amazing research happening up there on climate. And so I went with these scientists out three days into the tundra where they are studying these pygmy reindeer and living amongst them. Those are the little bad tummy guys. Pretty cute. So, I'm going to share with you a little three minute teaser for the short film. We're only a small team out now. And it really feels like we are the only humans on it. The quiet out here really is pushing on you. And you can almost feel it with your fingers. And even though it's quiet, it really smothers all the sound. Every day we go out and look for rangers. Rangers are like super fat endurance athletes. Life for them here in Rangdalen is really, really good. As the climate has changed, it's made the food grow a lot. And now they're everywhere in Rindalen. It is strange to think that humans almost hunted them to extinction. This is Olita. She is one of my absolute favorite people. This is Tandel. And her name means love. We live in a cabin named after reindeers. We work with reindeers and we are constantly surrounded by reindeers. Still, I never get tired of them.
We get the news that a polar bear recently was spotted just some kilometers away. Weather is doing some crazy things. If I could ask Svalbard Rangers anything, I would be so curious to to hear if they they have they can feel the change or if they are still uh, pretty happy with how it's going. Sometimes it seems that everyone is looking for this big dramatic change in climate. But it's also important to look at the trickle. First one's going to sneak peek of Ray Chaplin. <laughs> um, and with these stories, so obviously they're out there, they're trying to understand what's going on with the reindeer, what has led to these conditions, how those conditions are affecting them, um, and how long this kind of Goldilocks zone that they're in unexpectedly is going to last. But with a lot of storytelling, I, I'm not just looking to convey the information, right? I want people to actually get beyond that talking head, factoid information, which is very important, but is often not what helps connect us to these issues with stories. I want to actually show people what it's like to live their lives, whether you're a farmer, a rancher, a scientist, an explorer, um, living in a city, feeling something, uh, because I think that when we step into those shoes as best that we can, uh, we have an open invitation to better understanding. So my motto is to approach everything with curiosity and wonder. This brings me to the beginning of Barometer Words, which actually started right here um, with a project that I've been working on. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit of that and how it got me up to where you see the birds in that previous photo. This is my home. I've traveled all over the world working on projects, but I've always found that the stories happening at home are just as big and important as the ones happening. Astoria is the first home I have chosen for myself. For years, it lived purely as a dream. It's here that I found a story that has resonated deep in my soul. So if you can guess, I haven't necessarily lived in Astoria that long. I've only been here about five years. The funny thing, though, is when I was buying my house, um, I was looking at houses with my mom, and she informed me that my grandpa was born in the church in Chinook. My great-grandfather was the preacher there, and I had no idea when I decided to move out here, so something must have been calling me. But from the moment I moved to Astoria, I've just been inspired. There's Ever, if ever there is a town that is living at that cusp of past and present and understanding identity and what it's going to be moving forward, this is it. And it's just so vibrant and alive and intertwining. And in the house next door to me were a bunch of researchers who were working on this bird. Um, at the time, I'm on East Sand Island. And so I would see, you know, they would bring samples back sometimes from the island and I was reading up on the issues here, and I just became very fascinated by what's going on with the double-crested cormorants. So I'm just curious, how many of you have seen the double-crested cormorants around here? Oh, not as many folks as I would think. Um, well, then my next questions don't really matter that much. <laughs> I was gonna ask how many people like them and how many people hate them, <laughs> how many people are indifferent. 
Um, but Astoria, until recently, was home to the largest nesting colony of double-crested cormorants in North America. And there's been controversy over the birds. Um, and so I became fascinated with that story. So if you've lived out here and you've seen the cormorants, you may have seen scenes like this in the spring where thousands of them come down to the rivers and they surround the net pens uh, and wait for the hatchery releases and then they they just they go crazy you know it's like the best all you can eat buffet a cormorant could ask for and they've really learned about this kind of cycle and of course that has led to a lot of conflicts and the birds even they fly up the rivers in these huge numbers and and it's a, an incredible natural phenomenon happening right here. I mean, you go to, if, if this weren't our home, if this weren't, you know, a salmon fishery, people would probably look at this like they'd see it on BBC, Planet Earth or something, and just be like, wow, you know, this is crazy. But there's all these nuances that happen with a bird that is in a situation like here. And it has its good and its bad. This is Melissa Coleman. She's at the Wildlife Center of the North Coast, and they have a cormorant named Cormie. Um, she was injured when she was little, and she now lives at the center. She's an ambassador bird, and she and Melissa have formed a very special bond. And so they are learning how to do all sorts of tr new trainings, and we find out that these birds are actually extremely intelligent. I also want to document how we're trying to adapt and, and work with living with these birds. So this project has been a way of, of getting to know my new home in ways that I don't think would be, I'd be able to do otherwise. So I'm going out with the hatchery workers. They're letting me come out and spend time with them as they do adaptive practices like release the net pens at night um, under complete darkness. The only light in this is a flash that's off to the side. And this is, they do it at a high tide, and it's to give the, the juvenile salmon kind of a head start against the hungry mouths of the birds. And the birds themselves are, are beautiful. So the birds both don't really live on East Sand Island anymore. There was a, a big culling campaign to try to like push them off the island, and, and it worked, but it has some unintended consequences, which was that the birds ended up on the Astoria Mega Bridge. <laughs> Um, and and now there's, you know, at a peak time, been about 11,000 birds uh, living on the bridge, three different species of cormorant, and of course they are nesting and pooping all over it, and so that creates a new set of challenges as we try to all live together. And Believe it or not, I got ODOT. I approached ODOT, Oregon Department of Transportation, and asked them, could I put a time-lapse camera up on the bridge? And they were like, no one's ever asked <laughs> if we could do that before. But we wrote up a permit. I got a partnership with Oregon State, and um, we talked to the engineers who are doing a lot of maintenance on the bridge, and got approval from the Coast Guard, and it took like six months. <laughs> but I got approval to put time-lapse camera up on the bridge. And so for one season, a couple of years ago, I had this camera on this nest for the entire summer taking a picture once every six minutes for about two months. Um, I don't have the time-lapse yet because I haven't put it together. But it was very cool because I saw a family go from sitting on eggs to hatching to fledging their chicks all in one season. And it was also during that, that heat dome event that we had. And so I got to see how the birds reacted to this extreme weather event as well. The engineering crews let me crawl down underneath the bridge with them as they're doing the maintenance work. Uh, they're removing all the nests and spray painting all the guano up or spray washing all the guano off of it because it's highly corrosive. And you know, the county has just spent millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars refurbishing it and continue to do so. I think the project is, a, is about a $70 million project. And then there's the other side too, where those birds you see flying up the river, one day I was out there and I just hear guns going off 
and I start to see cormorants floating down the river. And, you know, that's something you also don't want to see. So I bring you back to Cormy because she's adorable and charming. So they are continuing their training and she even starred in a little short film. I'm only playing the first minute. But one of the things that we did with this short film is we took a lot of the assumptions about cormorants and decided to own them and turn them a little on their head. So you'll get a sense of that in this little teaser. She goes on to perform a heist, breaks out, starts stealing people's wallets. It's mayhem. But um, we made this film where we were helping to fundraise for the Wildlife Center, and we're actually still in the process of uh, finishing out her fundraising to build her new enclosure with a big swimming pool. But she's really um, gotten good at this taking money thing. She'll take it right from kids and put it in a box now all by herself. Um, but, you know, with, this, with these projects, I'm not trying to tell you what we need to have on the issue. Um, even if sometimes I, I, well, I do have an opinion, but for me it's really about trying to understand what's going on and then present that to you. And if there's really a hot button, if I do what a solution, I don't know what the solution is for cormorants. I think they're really cool but I see the challenges that they present. So it's, it's really a matter of exploration, trying to learn from people and share that in a way that I hope most of the rest of us would actually want to receive that information. And then maybe the solutions will help kind of bubble to the surface, who knows? Or we'll find more room to have more tolerance for these things. So it was while working on cormorants down here in Oregon, and I worked with a lot of scientists, I still do, this is a very unfinished project yet. Um, but one of the things happening with cormorants down here was pioneered on the Columbia River, was actually attaching accelerometers to cormorants. So cormorants are great divers, they can handle the most treacherous of ocean conditions, go places that people can't go, even our machines can't go. And so scientists are actually putting devices on cormorants and setting them free, and the cormorants are doing their thing, and they're revealing all sorts of information about the physics of the ocean. So some projects are looking at you know, how the cormorants navigate and learning about the birds and how they're reacting to conditions. Other projects are literally using the birds to collect data on the ocean. And they've even used cormorants to map the near coastal sea that they've used cormorants here in the Columbia to map the Columbia River, the floor of the Columbia River. 
And one of those projects takes place here. This is a little area called Middleton Island up in Alaska. So I'll do a little Google Earth thing, show you where it is. Get to see my fancy screen recording. I'm zooming in and Middleton, Alaska is this little peanut of land <laughs> that's about 100 miles from Anchorage. And it's, the whole island I think is about seven miles long and a couple miles wide. So you zoom back out again and it, it disappears really quick. It's just a little teeny tiny place. It's a very new piece of land, only about 5,000 years old. How often do you know you walk on a piece of land that's only 5,000 years old? And so its entire ecological history has happened in a very rapid amount of time. We've been present there for, you know, well, Europe, Europeans have had a, an impact there for probably the last 100 years. There's uh, <coughs> tribal nations, the Chugach Nation, that have sacred lands on this island as well and their history goes back way longer. And one of the first impacts that we as humans had on the island was in the late 1800s uh, with fox farming. And so we went over there, we introduced foxes, and it was a very kind of contained, basically the, this island had a lot of birds on it. <laughs> Maybe got the hint from the first photo. And so these foxes are contained on this small island with all of these nesting seabirds. And it was just the best conditions for farming foxes and then being able to kill them for their furs, for the fur trade. During World War II, the USS Colebrook ran itself aground. So the USS Colebrook was a 390-ish foot um, diesel-powered steamship that was built in 1919 and it was used on cargo runs for many decades and it would run over to a lot of um, Asian countries, a lot, a lot of countries, places in Japan and things like that. And during, I'll, I'll just want to read a couple things from, because I can't memorize all of this stuff. It's been really fun researching this ship. <laughs> um, and I found some pretty interesting entries. So, she crossed the North Pacific to Shanghai, Hong Kong, Manila, Ilo Iloilo, Cebu, Nagoya, Shimizu, and Yokohama, returning from there to the Pacific Northwest. The Coal Brook made six voyages to the Far East for the American Mail Line. She returned from the last in December of 1941, leaving Japanese waters about three weeks before the war began. After the war started, the Coal Brook was turned over to War Shipping Administration and was allotted to the War Department for Alaskan use. During this period, the Coal Brook was armed. She carried two deck guns, one on the bow and one on the stern. She also carried several anti-aircraft gun tubs. While it is impossible to trace her route during the war, but during the six months prior to being lost on Middleton Island, it is known that she supplied several islands in the Aleutian chain and carried battle scars from combat action there. So on June 16, 1942, she ran aground on Middleton Island, and there's several different stories out there about why that happened. I mean, one of one story involved the the theory that she had been overloaded and her seams had started to come apart and so they ran her aground. Another theory was that um, she had strayed off course and in a heavy fog ran on the ground on a reef off of Middleton. Um, but one of the prevailing theories is that she was fleeing a Japanese submarine and ran herself aground on Middleton Island. And there she sits to this day. It has become an important part of Middleton's landscape, and for the past 65 years, a daytime marker beacon for pilots. Once a pilot saw the ship, they knew where, the middle, where they were at Middleton Island. Then, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the 1964 earthquake, 
It was the second largest earthquake ever recorded in human history, and it sent tsunamis down to the Oregon coast and caused a lot of damage. This is from Anchorage. But in a matter of seconds, this earthquake lifted Middleton Island up out of the water 12 feet. And this is where the USS Coldbrook sits today. She sits above the high tide line, and so she's quite largely intact and has been completely overtaken once again by nature. The birds nest on every available square inch. There are hundreds and hundreds of kittiwakes, common nerds, pelagic cormorants that nest on this ship. And the scientists out on Middleton, they'll go out there and they'll run observations and, and do tests studying the nesting habits of these birds. And I never knew until I went to this ship how beautiful shipwreck life is. Shipwreck life is the best life. You don't realize the colors of the pelagic cormorant until you get to see them in shipwreck light. <laughs> and there's all sorts of beautiful devastation. And warding over all of it up in the crow's nest is an actual eagle's nest that just swoops around plucking off chicks whenever they get hungry. And this is the research team heading back from one of their afternoons at the ship. So the other thing of note on Middleton Island in terms of human presence has been that in the 1950s, during the height of the Cold War, the US military decided to build a new Air Force station out there. So they started construction in 1954, they wrapped it up in 1956, and it cost about $2.8 million to build. Isn't that crazy? Even I think with like today's conversion rates, it's just like I can't imagine building a whole base for <laughs> less than $3 million. But its main purpose was to serve as an early warning system for anti-aircraft, anti-Soviet aircraft. And it had a pretty short lifespan. It, it was decommissioned in 1963 before the earthquake uh, because it was just too expensive to run. And a lot of the guys that were out there, it was like too harsh for the military, basically. They were like, oh, I don't like it out here. And so they shut it down. <laughs> But it le they left all of the buildings there to crumble. So this is more or less what it looks like today. It's like a time capsule. As my closer for this presentation before we get to any questions, I thought that rather than listening to me yammer on about Middleton, um, I would play a, it's pretty rough, um, but it's a short five minute piece where I asked a bunch of the researchers to send me voice memos about their time on Middleton. So just as a grounding factor, after this was decommissioned, um, in the 90s, a scientist uh, bought part of the island and turned it into a seabird research station that is now used by scientists all over the world to study seabirds. And seabird research has been going on there since as early as the 1950s, there was actually a biologist by the name of Robert Bausch who conducted a, an environmental assessment before the base was built in anticipation of the base being built, was, which was really far, far ahead of its time. This was before things like NEPA, the, you know, all the environmental assessments that were provided by EPA were taking place. And what that has created is the world's longest running continuous study of seabirds on Alaskan islands. When I first arrived in Middleton, there was frost all over my tent and all over the ground. I would sleep with two hot water bottles and I definitely didn't change my clothes because I was so cold in the morning that I just was like, you know what, I'm just gonna wear what I wore yesterday. I'm too cold to change. So the stinkiness factor was definitely high. Middleton Island is more or less like a second home to me. It probably strikes many people as a good home on first sight. At least I know it had that effect on me the first time I laid eyes on it. Flat as a pancake, no dramatic mountain scenery or sea cliffs, they're like buildings scattered out. 
The place definitely has a way of growing them over time. A seemingly endless shoreline with all manner of stuff washing up for beachgoers. An ever-present 360-degree view of the ocean. All the beautiful wildflowers and desert vegetation. Sunsets, and of course, all the bird life. In terms of the science that goes on, Middleton operations have, since the early 1990s, evolved into something truly unique worldwide. I'm referring, of course, to the repurposed radar tower that is the main focal point of secret research at the station. When I first walked into the tower, my mind was blown. I felt like a kid in a candy shop. Um, you walk up, and you're in this big room, and you just hear all the birds screaming. They're practically just screaming. And there's so much energy and life and you can feel it and you feel like you're a part of the colony. And you just get to watch them interact with each other, which is such a unique opportunity because at most breeding sites you can't be in the colony without disturbing them. But in the tower you can be there watching them for hours. You can watch them all day if you wanted to and learn so much. There's been continuous data collection of the black-legged kittiwigs nesting on the tower since 1995. As it turns out, the kittiwigs are highly responsive to, and therefore great indicators of change in their marine environment, namely things that affect their food supply. I ended up sampling uh, over 140 birds, and that entails catching them, which is a sport of its own, and I did ultrasounds on them. And that was so cool. I mean, we can measure their muscle thickness and see how that correlates to their flight. And, and then I ended up messing around with the crew with the, the ultrasound, looking at eyeballs and uh, finger joints and all sorts of fun stuff. The reason that I worked with the Pelagic Corporates is because I quickly fell in love with them from the moment I stepped foot into the tower. They have these long, freaky necks with these long pointed bills at the end, these big broad wings and these big goofy feet. It looks like they could trip over them. But working with cormorants is not an easy task. They're strong and they poop and they keep pooping and they don't stop pooping. But yeah, they poop everywhere. I think by the end of the season, I had a thick layer of poop on my green jacket looked more white and yellow than it did green. But that's just what you gotta do when you love these birds and you want to protect them. I never cease to be amazed at the wonderful camaraderie, the esprit de corps, and indeed international goodwill that occurs reliably every year at the Middleton Station. It's crazy how when you put aside political beliefs and opinions about all sorts of topics, it still doesn't define a person because everyone has a unique experience that you haven't lived and that you can learn from. And so I learned to get closer with people by living with them, hearing about their stories and learning from them. Being on Middleton is the best isolated feeling. It's a good isolation being on Middleton. You're with a group of people that all love the birds that you're working with. And you all have the same passion for what you're doing. And there's so much camaraderie together. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, my name is Stella Solaz. This is Alex's recording. Anyways, that should probably be enough material. And uh, cheers.
hear your question. For all the women, that was a great talk, thank you. For all the women that was in that tower, were they there originally or were they put there to preserve the birds? No, so that they were not there originally. The science team came in and they removed the dome on the top and then retrofitted the radar tower with all of those windows. And I like to think of it as like, um, so it's all one-way glass. The birds, they look, they look like they're looking at you, but they're just narcissists. They're looking at themselves. Um, <laughs> But I like to think of them as like uh, those old-fashioned vending machines with the slices of pie in them. Like you can slide the window open and grab the bird. <laughs> yeah. Next, they need to add. They, it needs to rotate though, really, to complete that. That I think analogy. <laughs> Obviously, living here for five years in Astoria, with the Corman situation, obviously, um, so many different opinions and controversies over them. But uh, have you seen that they have kind of, especially obviously living with the bridge, have you seen that they've more made more of an impact on the rest of the bird habitat in general, or is that something that you even have access of research to? So the question is, have the cormorants made more of an impact on bird habitat, or? Yeah, in terms of like impacting other bird populations in ah. the area. No, actually, there hasn't been any indication that cormorants are impacting other seabirds in the area. So um, I think because they are so visible, that they it's easy to kind of look at them and think that they're causing a lot more problems than they actually are. They're an easy target, but. Um, they have increased their consumption of salmon since moving to the bridge, so ironically, I think there's now talks about trying to get the cormorants to move back to East Sand Island. <laughs> yeah. Uh-oh, Bruce, you know, <laughs> tough question, I think. That's Watch out. That's a hard one. Oh, there's your question. With Middleton Island? Yeah. Um, that's not a dumb question at all. Um, okay. No. So I think one of the cool things that they have been able to observe is because they have so much data going back so far, they when there there have been some recent um, very intense events that have lasted years, there's a thing called the, the, the blob, uh, which was this big area of super warm water that moved through the North Pacific. And because they had data on the birds and how they were doing before the blob event, they could see how all these different species were reacting to that new warm water coming in and just sitting up there for several years. And so they had a lot of um, collapse of, of the nesting colonies, not complete collapse, but you know they, they had fewer successes with raising offspring. The um, kitty wakes developed much more like Arnold Schwarzenegger-y chest muscles and stuff because they had to fly a lot harder and farther to find bait fish, which are um, had to move, you know, into deeper, cooler waters. The cormorants, they showed the cormorants were uh, diving even deeper and longer to go after those fish to get down to them. And um, one of the coolest things I learned, though, that's an ongoing thing, in my opinion anyway, is that um, they are using the birds up there at NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is actually using fish collected by tufted puffins and rhinoceros auklets that are brought back to survey bait fisheries in the North Pacific. That's their main source of 
understanding what's happening with big fishery populations is from these birds on Middleton that fly out. They come back with bill loads, so like our bill loads right now his hands, and um, they basically steal some of the fish from the birds that come back, and that's how they monitor the abundance and diversity of, of these bait fisheries that are super important to the entire ocean and to commercial fisheries and things like that. Lorna, thanks for a great talk. Um, could you share any ideas you might have, the things that you're pondering, or if you had unlimited time that you might want to work on, maybe even some yeah. local projects? Yes. Wow, thanks. I feel like that was a gift <laughs> question. <laughs> um, obviously, I'm still working on cormorants. So if any of you have personal experience or stories with cormorants, good, bad, just weird, I want to hear about them. Um, I'm still out there photographing them. Um, but a big one is the elk. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm in the process of writing some grants right now to get some funding for that. But if any of you have contacts with, with uh, folks working on elk, if you live with elk and have had issues with them, I want to hear those stories. I'm looking for places where I might be able to put some camera traps that show kind of the intersection of between elk and, and our daily lives. So uh, it's always, all of these pictures that I get are, are not because I'm like some adventurer going out to all these spots. Uh, it's because I have other people helping to make these images happen. Um, so these stories, I get to share them because I have folks like you that help make them possible. So yeah, that's the big thing. Just take down my email and uh, pester me about elk and cormorants. And if you've got another big issue ticket item, like I, I want to do like a whole series on key species in this region. I want to do something on sturgeon. I want to do something on sea lions. Like I think there will be no shortage of inspiration for decades to come. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you. Well, two questions. Where did all the birds go during the winter time? And then does anything happen to Sand Island since the birds were chased off? Anything that's been happening that's not to anybody? Yeah. So are you wanting to know where the Middleton birds go or where these cormorants go down in Nessaray? Okay. So I don't actually know the full answer to that. And I don't think the scientists necessarily know yet either because um, it relies on satellite tracking over a long term. But um, they most of the birds leave the island. Uh, I think some of the tufted puffins um, might come down here and pelagic cormorants as well. Um, Kittiwakes are really, um, what's the word, not ubiquitous because their numbers are actually very near threatened species at this point. Um, but they're very versatile and they can use a lot of habitat so they go, I think they go everywhere um, up and down the west coast. The East Sand Island question, I have to get in touch with um, James Lawan at ODFW and some of the folks at Army Corps to find out what's actively happening there now. There's still, I think, a small number of birds that attempt nesting on the island. One of the big things that happened out on East Sand is in addition to the culling that happened that, that stressed the birds out enough that they wanted to leave, there was also an uptick in bald eagle predation. Um, and that causes what's called dread flights. So the parents get scared off and expose the chicks and the eggs to the bald eagles, and then the bald eagles come in and they have a heyday, but so do other birds like uh, crows and ravens and things like that. So that problem hasn't been solved. That's like one of the reasons that the cormorants love the estuarium and the ridge so much. It's like the perfect anti-bald eagle, anti-human, um, habitat for them because bald eagles don't like the bridge. Uh, humans aren't going to be shooting a bunch of guns at them <laughs> at that bridge. And so it's they're going to have to figure something out to try to entice them to go back. And in the past, that's been done with things like decoys and bird calls. But they, I don't know if they're going to have to potentially build some infrastructure there to provide some sort of cover from bald eagles if they want to be successful. That's just from discussions with biologists, so don't quote me on any of that. 
but those are the kinds of things that they're thinking about when trying to navigate what to do next. Okay, thanks a lot for the presentation. These guys, uh, uh, are they just natural or are they invasive? They're natural. Well, and yeah, hey, I mean, what's the deal? Yeah, I know. It gets complicated though. I mean, we have we have all sorts of systems too where things go haywire that are natural. Like you would think about the bark beetle that that is a native species in the Rocky Mountain West, but conditions have given them everything they need to thrive. Uh, the winters aren't cold enough to kill them off, and so they have just exploded. And all the trees are the right age, and it was like it's just a hot mess over there now, like literally. <laughs> All right, let's give one more round of applause for Morgan Hyde. So next week's speaker is our final week of past and present for this year. It's going to be Samantha Stearman, and she is a dispatcher for the Columbia River Bar Pilots. So hopefully I will see you all again next Tuesday at 11 o'clock. It's supposed to be a really great talk. Samantha has some really interesting stuff to tell us about her work with the bar pilots. Um, we still have five spots left for the Giyotaku workshop. That's fish printing with artist Duncan Berry on Friday, February 24th. So if you are interested, there are still five spots for that Friday program. And there are also still some scholarships available if anyone's interested in that. So they can email our education director, Katie Many. That's at M-E-N-N-E -N -N -E at crmm.org. We have two spots still open for the watercolor class in March that filled up very quickly, so thank you for your support on that. If you are still interested, those two spots are probably gonna go fast, so I would get on that soon. And last but not least, we're gonna open up registration in the next week or so for a Seize the Day trivia on Saturday, March 18th from 6 to 8 p.m. We're gonna feature three rounds of trivia with maritime books, movies, history, environmental science, pop culture, all that good stuff. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Again, if you did not check in with the front desk already, please make sure you do that on your way out. Thank you so much again for coming. Thank you very much to Morgan, and have a great rest of your day.